front row seats up here. Everyone, yeah. Why wouldn't you want to be in the front row? There we go. <laughs> I understand. All right, we'll give a couple minutes here. We have um, two shorter videos tonight that we're planning to play. Yeah, two shorter videos. One on uh, the reason for testings, and uh, you know, um, and then the other one is on being awake unto righteousness as a soul winner. So. So we got two, so the first one's about 23, 24 minutes, the second one's about 22, 23 minutes, something like that. And I think you'll probably have some questions, you know, just, so I'm not, I'm not like opposed to letting you listen to Pastor Stevens and uh, some of the things that you'll hear in there, you'll, you'll have some questions about, I'm sure, just about some of the things he's talking about, but these are important Lessons, you know, short, compact kind of lessons about uh, these uh, these uh, things that happen to us, trials and tests, and then also about the need to be soul winners. So, everyone okay? Everyone all right? You know, so this is where we are tonight because of the GGCA play. That is tomorrow evening and Saturday. If you want to support them, be awesome. The seniors and the juniors, high school doing that, that'd be awesome if you would, those who were in the play here, you could see the the next generation that's coming, Uh, so that's happening, Uh, let's see, what else, Um, uh, so we have uh, this week and two more weeks, so we'll have class this week, class next week, Uh, on the 12th we'll have a class, but also a review for the final, Uh, your final in this foundations class will be on the 19th of May. Okay, the 19th of May, it'll be uh, 6 o'clock, and it'll be in this classroom. Okay? All right, so you can check uh, what you might be missing, and uh, I'll go through it this week and try and give you a sense of what uh, you need to turn in. Uh, The booklet that you were supposed to read, Guard Your Heart, don't forget about that. You're supposed to turn in a 250-word report on that, so... It would be nice if I could get those sooner rather than later. It's all right. I just love my last week of May to be filled with reading your lovely papers. Uh, I mean, they are lovely. They are lovely. Yes, they are. They are. I believe the best about every single one of them. Trust me, I do. Okay, so it's awesome. But, uh, yeah, so this is uh, Pastor Stevens from, uh, I'm not quite sure what year this one is from. It's in 95, 96. But this first one is the purposes of the testings uh, that we have in terms of being uh, believers. So you'll, uh, he talks also about rewards and how those rewards are applied to us, both uh, in the interim period and then both, you know, because there is a day coming when we'll all be joined in our resurrected bodies. So there's some things that I might have to explain to you in that. So I want to get started on this here. Uh, so Lord, we thank you for giving us this time together uh, to listen and to learn from you. We thank you for your ministry to us, for your righteousness, uh, for the way that you've kept our our class and uh, our classes and our students in all that they have had to face this semester. Uh, We pray that you would continue to bless them, lead them, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing uh, in the Bible College, and we just uh, pray for a great end of the semester and for a great future and a summer. All those things that will be happening, Lord, the graduation coming up in a month, all these things are in your hand. And uh, we just ask you to bless us now as we concentrate on these words from Pastor Stevens. Amen. Okay, Cody. Father, today we thank you for this very privilege we have to come to you as a corporate group and together from the pulpit in the pew to receive the word of God and allow it to be quick, quicken us and to be powerful in our souls and make our spirit man thrive and live and nourish with divine truth. We ask you to bless this message as you have the beautiful singing this morning, the offering in Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. We want to, we're so glad to have uh, Pastor Nichols with us. Would you stand? Our dear friend has got 
Thank you. And his brother and wife that I know from west, out in the western part, Tacoma, Seattle, Bobby and Audrey, where are they? Would they stand, please? Thank you. God bless you. <clears throat> now, as we preach this message this morning, we want you to really guard your heart to listen. The, there has never honestly been, probably, no doubt, in the history of Christianity, there has never been what you're going to face in the next few years. And Jesus Christ will be precious, but there has never been what you're going to face in the next six years of your life in, the, in your lifetime. Now, 1 Peter chapter 1 kind of grooms this message today. It says, wherein in verse 6, you greatly rejoice though now for a season, if need be, you, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, it might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though you now see him not, Yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. <clears throat> it's very crucial in the Word of God to enter into two total different understandings. Many times, temptation strictly deals with trials that become our tests from God. They are tests. Now, we read this morning in James 1.13, let no man say when he is tempted that he is tempted of God. For the Lord tempteth no man. Therefore, it would be better to say for your understanding, let no man say when he is tested or tried that uh, when he's absolutely tempted with a direct agent from Satan or the old sin nature, let him not say it is of God. God doesn't tempt any man, neither can God be tempted. So stop blaming God for your trials. That's what this is saying. However, Satan tempts and God tests. Now, what is the purpose of the testings of God? The purpose of the testings of God are to show us the things that are in our lives, and God allows the test to come to bring them into surface, where we can see them, to bring them to surface, surface, and to surface them. Let me illustrate it. God said in Jeremiah 17, 10, I, the Lord, search the hearts and test the emotions. All right? So when God brings a trial or God brings a test, he's searching out the heart for you. He already knows what it is. And then he's testing how your emotions respond to what comes against you. Then he gives you the results of your reactions. That means he brings it to a surface so you can see what you're like under that particular test. Now, when we are tested, because God doesn't tempt anybody, then Satan does everything in his power to come in to tempt us. So now we'll do the message. So therefore, God must test a believer. If an athlete has rehearsed and done a whole lot of training, eventually they have to play in the competitive uh, competition of the sport. Now, when we study the Word of God and receive the Word of God, ultimately, we have to be tested for what we have been listening to from the Word of God. 
You can do two things when you're tested. You can whine. You can withdraw and be angry. You can get bitter. You can become vindictive. You can become proud. You can become reactionary. You can blame somebody. Or you can get into evil. That's what you can do when you're tested. And what God does through that trial is to show you some things in your life that have never been dealt with ever by the cross. And all he wants to do is to deal with them so they will not be in your life anymore. Now, by the same token, when you are tempted by Satan with God's permission, and you resist that temptation, this is what happens. Then the trial of your faith becomes precious or esteemed by God with a very high value. And he adds to your soul right now in your soul body. If you died right now, your soul would leave your body and go to heaven as a believer. And your soul, if you didn't have the physical body, would also be an invisible body. And by the way, that's the interim body that's in heaven of all the saints whose physical bodies, when they die, are in the grave, but their spiritual bodies, mixed with their souls, go to heaven, and everybody in their soul body sees everybody else's soul body. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.21 that the spirit of the saved man goes upward, absent from the body and present with the Lord, and is gained in 2 Corinthians 5.8 and Philippians 1.21. The souls were in heaven in Revelation 6, 8, and 10 of those that were martyred in the tribulation period, those believers at that time. Now listen very carefully. This is such a crucial message. I have been extremely silent since about 3 o'clock this morning because I've been pondering on the seriousness of the hour. Now, I'm saying to you this morning that God is going to test you. Then I'm saying this. Satan is also going to tempt you. If you're positive and look to God and are occupied with Christ during your trials, your soul body gets degrees of glory now so that when you die, you have a fantastic, rich, large soul body that wins tremendous rewards in heaven. Not only that, but every time that you have a trial and you come through it positively, a degree of glory at that second is added to your glorified body in eternity when you get it. Therefore, it becomes eventually a white raiment over your regular glorified body. Every Christian will have a glorified body, but you will have brighter, brighter glory over your glorified body. In other words, you will have tremendous brightness over an already glorified body. So you have a degrees of glory added to your soul body, and then you have degrees of glory added to your glorified body only because you were relaxed and came through tremendously under pressure and didn't internalize the circumstances or what was happening to you. So the Bible says, count it all joy when you f uh, fall into poikilos. Doesn't mean fall in. The word in the Greek is all around you are, are going to be trials and you fall into what's around you. That's what it says in the Greek. Count it all joy.
That's when God tests you. Therefore, when you get to heaven, you're not going to have to wonder if, if you're an amazingly approved Christian at the Beamer seat. If you find out that you have a glorified body way brighter than somebody else's up there, you know you, you were good under trials and you suffered with Christ and glorified his name. You didn't murmur. You didn't come under your old sin nature. You didn't become bitter. You didn't get proud. You were not vindictive. You were not reactionary. You didn't blame a soul for anything. That meant you passed the test and resisted the temptation of Satan during your vulnerability of the trial from God. Now, in the past 12 hours, I simply closed my eyes and asked Jesus to put into my heart what was on his mind. And I kept them close. And this is what I saw. I saw a funeral parlor. And I saw the sadness of a little baby dying through crib death at six months. I saw the parents go to the graveside and say goodbye to a little girl who's only six months old. Jesus went to Jerusalem and beheld the city and wept over it. I, I saw some precious people that were in a car accident. One would, was dead and the other was bleeding and the ambulance came down the road to pick up one and then the other. And everybody that knew the people were screaming. I, I saw the little retarded child pass to the mother's arm as a little baby for her, for her ch uh, first child. I I saw somebody being told that they would be blind in six weeks, six months. I saw somebody, a wife, who was a beautiful mother and a lovely woman of God, and her husband went out on her multiple times, and she finally finds it out. I saw her weep. I saw the young girl that uh, got pregnant and carries a baby with no daddy. I, I saw somebody who were told that they've got two months to live and they have terminal disease cancer. And the family gathers and they talk it all over. And then I saw the tremendous need of aged people in the nursing home who in many cases have been forgotten. They've given and given and given, but very few people truly care for them now. They're aged. And there's nothing about them except true love would want to be with them because of the tremendous love that's in that family. I saw the young man that's 21 years of age that gets a sentence in prison for armed robbery. 15 years, say goodbye to his mother and his first time he ever did it. You see, we are Christians that are strangers in Satan's cosmic world. And we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We are believer priests representing man to God. We are ambassadors representing God to man. 
I saw a husband who found out that he thought his wife was right with God, that she'd been getting, committing promiscuity with somebody else. She's sublimating because he isn't the husband he ought to be. I saw the deafs as they went through the valley of deafness. What went on in their hearts as they came into a brand new world of understanding life without being able to hear properly or speak as they grew to know God and to enjoy life through the language of the deaf. I saw the military men that have come home without a leg, without an arm, and go through the rest of their life handicapped. I saw the little child in a wheelchair that will never run. Never run. I saw those in intensive care between life and death, and loved ones are in the hallway waiting to see the verdict. Can they see them just for a few moments? I saw the homeless, for whatever reason, without food, trying to find shelter in the cold of the winter. That's what I saw. But I saw something else. I saw people who are successful from the standpoint of human viewpoint and who may be good people but have never received Jesus Christ as their Savior and if they died this very morning they would spend all eternity in hell without Jesus Christ and though they are humanly speaking good they have never made a commitment to a personal Savior and I saw them as they go through life thinking that religion will get them to heaven and human good will get them to heaven and being baptized as a baby will get them to heaven. And I saw them as they go through life and they have a high scale of living, but they've never taken time for the one that created them, for the one that redeemed them, for one that loves them, for one that died and shed his blood for them, for one that was buried and rose again, for the one that knocks at their door and asks if he could come in. Then I saw the drug addict as he tries and tries and strives to win a victory. He doesn't want to do it. Now he's sick of it. It's wearing him out. His emotions, the chemist and chemicals of his body are getting weaker and weaker and he has no identity and he's striving and struggling and trying but goes back into it again, out of it for three weeks, back again, out of it for two weeks, back again, out of it for two months, back again. I saw the alcoholic that sips in the poison and slowly doesn't realize that the organs in his body will pay for the poison he's taken in. I saw the young married couple that uh, have a child or maybe two children and the husband goes out on the wife. And there goes the family values, and there goes the sacred purpose of God, and there goes the great communion of love that could be so sacred and precious between them as he goes out on his precious wife instead of esteeming her with a great value and loving her with all of his heart and treasuring his precious kids and bringing them up in an atmosphere of love and kindness and gentleness and peace and wisdom and purpose and meaning. I saw him as he sneaks around without purpose and doesn't fellowship with Christ though he is saved. I saw him in that few hours of having the eyes closed. Jesus, when it went to the hill of Jerusalem, many of you have been there with us, and he beheld the city, and the word of God says he wept. He wept. That's what he saw. I mean, he may have seen a lot of other things. Maybe he saw teenagers over in a K through 12, and maybe he said, oh, they don't realize it, but the, uh, the high school, the seniors and juniors, perhaps in just a few short years, they'll face 
a husband running out on them. They'll face their own sinful temptations. They'll, they'll face life as it really is, and they're not preparing for it. And, and that's another thing that Jesus Christ saw. Precious teenagers that he loves, not preparing when they have a chance to be prepared for the inevitable is coming just a few years. I saw a nation that is so liberal that homosexuals can marry homosexuals and adopt children and, and bring them up with two homosexuals. And I saw God's anger at the principle of it and at that type of sin that that perverts family life and the sacred values of marriage and the sacred values of the home. I saw two lesbians get married and parade it in the public and they don't care. And the nation says they have a right to choose and they don't have a right to choose publicly to be lesbians. If you think they do, ask God. I saw millions of babies that are in the womb that would be great precious men and women of God aborted without any say, without any right, without any possibility of choosing, murdering them in the womb just before their uh, months before they are born. I saw it and God said, I hate the, I hate what's going on. I despise it. Judgment will come upon America. Judgment will come upon Washington, D.C. Judgment will come. I saw it. The trial of your faith, the test of your faith is precious because God is showing you your heart, not to condemn you, no, not to condemn you, not to condemn, he's showing you so you can grow to be like him through grace, through love, through forgiveness, and through the joy and peace of Jesus Christ in the indwelling God. He's testing you to show you that there's areas that you refuse to deal with, perhaps because of pride, perhaps because of insecurity, but whatever, you've refused to deal with them, and he's put his spotlight on them, but you react and don't deal with them. Deal with them and turn the test into victory. Turn the trial into joy. Turn the, the privilege into promotion. Because if you don't, Job passed the first two trials, and then in the third trial, Satan got in and tempted him, and pride took over. And then uh, Job, the second thing, vindictiveness took over. And in the third trial, bitterness took over. And in the f third trial, sublimation took over. And in the third trial, Job was tempted to become evil. That means to speak for Satan's government. And God showed him all of creation and all of his handiwork to rebuke him of, of being tempted with evil, the infectious government of Satan. But in the third test, a trial became yielding to temptation. You're vulnerable when you're being tried. You're vulnerable when you're being tested. Don't do it. You're vulnerable. Draw close to God and look unto Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of your faith, who counted it all joy and looked unto God the Father. And with a finished work, faith, he offers us for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross and despised the shame and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. Listen, you will have trials. You can mark it down. You will have trials. Make them precious in God's eyes. That's what 1 Peter 1, 7 says. So a degree of glory can be added to your soul body, and a degree of glory can be added to your glorified body, and you will be found to the praise and honor and applause of the angels, and then be found to the acceptance totally of Jesus Christ at his appearing to the end that you will be delivered. So count it all joy. Relax and know that God's plan is perfect, that he doesn't tempt you. Satan does. He tests you to show you, then help you and bless you and promote you. How many understand this? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes?
Okay. Um, <clears throat> wow, that was good. Huh? Very good. What year was that, Pastor? 1995. So let's go over it. Okay. So 1995. Uh, so we have trials. We have a few words. Uh, I can write on the board here, I think. And I'll just have you talk to your neighbor for a few moments, too. So we'll just break it down. We have, first of all, the first word is trials. So uh, this is um, James 1, 2, the trial of your faith. Also, First Peter, he used, was it 1, 5, being very precious is the trials. And the second word temptation and what's the difference between a trial and a temptation once from God once from Satan yeah uh, uh, yeah yeah so okay um, uh, where do trials all right James 1 13 God is not tempted, and neither does he tempt us. So I'd like to know what does this word really mean, temptation? What's the, what's, the, what's the difference between a temptation and a trial? Okay, one is from God, the trial is from God. Where, where do we read that? Genesis um, 22, verse 1. Um, God tested Abraham. God tested Abraham. He was, he was tested. Another one, David. David was tempted by the devil. Uh, help me with the with the verse. Is it First Chronicles? I think I'm losing my book. What? Okay. David was tempted. Could somebody look that up for me, Pastor Steve? Would you do that? Where was David tempted by the devil to number the people? Was it First Chronicles, First Chronicles twenty two one maybe? Also, was Jesus tempted in the wilderness? What is it? Twenty one. Is it twenty one one? Okay. Jesus was tempted of the devil in Matthew 4, 1 through 7. Um, temptation. If, if you test drive a car, when you go to the dealership to test drive a car, what are you looking for when you test drive a car? You've never done it before? Come on, you can talk back to me. You see if you like it. What are you going to check? What? How smooth it drives? Does it run? Do the windows work? You know, how does it handle? And are you testing it to approve it and find out what it is? It's the model I like. It's the... It has the engine I like and so on. And what's the, it's very possible when you test it, or yeah, when you test it here, test, uh, you approve it, okay? This is how God looks at your life. He wants to, he wants to approve of your life. He wants to say amen to your life. He wants to say, see, they did it. They were able to handle that. They were, it worked. My, they found my grace. They found my, my, they found me in their trial. When the devil tempts you, what's his motivation? To destroy. It's different. What is, when, he, when he tempts you, what does he want to do? He wants to bring you, come over here. Come over here to the edge of the cliff here. 
come over here and be with me. Come, come and be, so I can destroy you. Does God do that? That's what it says in James 1.13. He never is tempting you because the temptation is to destroy you, but he tries you to approve, to reinforce in you the truth, to show you and I his nature, to find God. That's the difference between these two words. There are many different kinds of trials. We can talk about that in a minute. Many different kinds of trials in life, but none of them are designed of God to destroy you. But the devil is, is tempting. Uh, he tempts us in order to disapprove of us and to take us down. Yeah, okay? So there's a, there's a lot of things to say about the subject, but that one point is very important. Uh, okay, so talk to your neighbor about it for a minute. And just, by the way, it's in the Greek. I don't have my, my, uh, my le lexicon with me, but there's uh, two different words. This word for temptation is uh, different from this one for our testing or trials. But I don't have it in front of me, so. But talk to each other about it and explain what I just said to your neighbor.
Okay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, the second point, let's, Lord Jesus, really bless these minutes together. And your name, thank you for every student here and for our listening ears. Help us, lead us, teach us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. The second thing that I heard in the class was that actually I've got two hearts here. One of them is a, has a hole in it. And sometimes this heart with the hole in it, which is the flesh, produces a lot of trouble for me. So I can reap Galatians 6. If I sow to the flesh, I reap the flesh. How many trials or troubles people have in life are self-produced? Can you think of any? That I produce these troubles, right? Is it a trial? Yes. But it's to teach me something, and that's to live in the spirit. That I want to learn how to live in the spirit. Why are you always fighting with people? Because that's the way I am. That's the way I was brought up. Well, change. Be spirit-filled. Have a renewed mind. Romans 12, 2. I always have trials in my life. I always have trouble. People don't like me. I have trouble at school, at work, and so on. Well, <laughs> maybe you're producing a lot of that trouble because you, you, need, you need to learn what we're talking about, and I do because... Life doesn't have to be that hard. But sometimes we've heard the phrase, you made your bed, now sleep in it. And maybe the decisions that I have made and the habits I have and how I talk to people, I need to learn another way. Because that, those aren't really the trials that Ted Pastor is talking about, though they do fit into a category, we could say. These are like a look at the word trials, though there are divers, um, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, divers in the King James is various, so we, we're going to talk for a minute about various troubles that people have in life, and one of them is this, and it is me. My biggest problem in life is Okay, so it's me, Romans 7. Uh, learn about it. You're in a good school. You're in your faith. Learn about it, and maybe your life will go easier. And you'll learn how to handle life because you're dealing with it. Pastor mentioned also the cross, didn't he? He said he talked about the cross, and and how I can apply the cross in my life. Number two is my circumstances or events or an event in my life that is hard for me, outside of me. Like maybe uh, I lose my job, I uh, lose my girlfriend, I have health problems. Um, I, um, the death of a loved one, uh, a friend forsakes me, it's outside of me. And one of the things that Pastor mentioned is, is how I relate to that trial will also reflect back to me. So let's say this, reflect back or how I process it, process my circumstances. How do I process it when there's no food, no water, no safety, no protection? How do I process life? All right, could you sit there for a minute on it and talk about it with your neighbor? Meditate on it, think about it, and talk for a minute.
Okay. Uh, this is a whole class in itself, isn't it? Okay, I have a problem. How do I handle it, you know? Right? In, in the message, Pastor said, what are you going to do? He said, he said you have two options, but he, I just heard him say the one. But he said, are you going to withdraw? Are you going to become bitter? Are you going to be resentful? Are you going to complain? Are you going to? So if we put in here the book of Job and how Job is trying to process his trouble. It's a good story of how it may not be very easy to process life when you go through a trial. It, it might not be very easy. But we learn and we talk to ourselves all the time, you know, saying, Lord, help me when I am tried and teach me. The humble he will teach, Psalm 25, 9. Um, it's really a big issue in our faith because I don't want to become, and, and here's a, let's go in a negative thing. The trial produces in me this uh, withdrawn negative person, and then Pastor mentioned the communication evil in that actually I can become part of a, a negative group, negative or demonic. He called it evil, communication evil. Communication is a poneros evil, poneros is a Greek word. It's communicative evil. So uh, that's a very real thing that happens to people. They, they very get, let's say somebody is 25 years old, they grew up in a Christian church maybe, uh, they've been hurt very badly, they withdraw, they start to go against the faith, now they say they're an atheist, and they're very angry at God. And if you ask them why, it's because the way my father was, or the way I was brought up, or and this bitterness grows in them. Then they get onto social media and they find the group that is anti-evangelical, anti-God, anti-Bible, and then they just are constantly going in this circle. And because it is like a circle, it's just they, they may not ever get out of it in their lifetime. And so guard yourself from that because this heart you know, if we took the both of them out and we put in there the new heart, it's like Jesus is able to, to process and in humility and truth have relationship with God and uh, be a sweet, edifying, wise, um, edifying believer. And he has a community he has a community of edification. So this is because the trial did not destroy him. And this is Hebrews 3, uh, has three times, is it 8, is it maybe uh, 10, maybe 12, there's, there's three times, let not your heart be hardened. What is it, don't, don't withdraw with a deceitful heart. And then there's one more heart mentioned there. Hard heart, deceitful heart. And I don't remember the third one. We could look at it. Okay, so uh, there was, there's some uh, thoughts. Talk to each other for a moment, and then um, we'll take a break and come back for the second part.
Uh, Sign-in sheets are back there, uh, so you can go and take a break for about 10 minutes. Also, there is a, a handout there that's a little essay from Pastor Stevens, so make sure you get that. That's part of the assignment there you'll see there. It's only short. It's only about uh, 500 words, but it's good stuff. Good stuff.
Okay, uh, we can start the the, the follow up on this. Uh, is Andrew here? No, Andrew. Okay, Andrew Silva. Okay, he's coming in. All right. I just in the break, there were people talking to me and asking questions and and so on. So we'll just continue on on this theme. And um, you know how how many how many of you have questions about it? Not questions, but you're interested in the subject, right? We're interested, yeah. So uh, one of the points was what Andrew mentioned as he looked it up in the lexicon. Did you look it up too, Pastor Steve? Yeah, we we have um, I think we we will just take this all down and and uh, make some points about the devil and about God. Okay, so Andrew, you 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 got uh, the here, here's this one. Yeah. Oh, you don't want to say it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I was I was looking the two words up, and uh, the word uh, used for test is. I mean, it's the same word used, but it's used in two different ways. The tense is used. One, one when it's used in First Peter one five, it's used. One six, it's used as like the test. The purpose of the test is to approve or the, to see how the the person reacts to it. And the other way it's used in um, in John in Matthew four is to tempt, to solicit, to sin. So there's two different ways. Like in in uh, when Jesus asked Philip, he said, "You feed them, you give them bread." He was testing him to see how he would react to it. So that was that word. And when Je when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, it was that to solicit him to sin. Good, great. So um, we could say, in a way, here's the. Okay, where did my mark? Here's the world, and here's the God of the world, the God of this world. It's Ephesians 2.2, 2, right? Is in a prince of the power of the earth, is a 2.3, the God of this world. But then there is God Almighty, right? Almighty God. Almighty God. So who is, who, who is really... You know, who is o over, when we are living in this world, we, there's two things that can be happening. One is that God puts us in trials, and Satan, okay, the God of this world, Satan tempts to destroy. Tempts to destroy. But could God use Satan could God use Satan 
uh, as his tool for our training and our development uh, in life. Yeah. Could, could, where do you find that in the Bible? That God allowed Satan to tempt us, right? He tempts us. This is Matthew 4. This is David, 1 Chronicles 22, 1. Uh, so he, he tempts, and yet isn't that also a trial that is allowed by God? Isn't it a trial that's allowed by God when I am tempted by Satan? You know, isn't it? Like uh, Samson and Delilah, his girlfriend, I mean, this was a temptation to tell her where his strength is coming from. It was a temptation so that they could destroy Samson. The Philistines could take him, take his eyes out, and destroy him. That was the purpose of the temptation. So Almighty God is saying, even though I am not the one that is going to be tempting you, because I don't have any interest in destroying you. Another one here is Job. Who caused the, climat, uh, the climatic catastrophes in the time of Job? But it says Satan did. And how about 1 Corinthians 5, when the man removed him from the fellowship so Satan could destroy his flesh? So Satan could destroy his flesh. That was, a, that was a chastisement unto death, you know. So there's a covering for the believer when he lives in submission and obedience to God. And who killed Jesus Christ? Who killed Jesus Christ? Acts, uh, um, is it 2.23? Uh, you have by evil men, evil men, have crucified him. But wait a minute. Did evil men crucify him? Yes, the God of this world crucified Christ, but Almighty God was behind it. But Satan was God's tool for that trial, okay, for that period of time. And he succeeded to destroy him. Satan succeeded to destroy Christ and crucify him, but he rose from the dead above, high above and beyond Satan with us. So it's an incredible victory that God gave. Okay, uh, um, there was another point. Any, any question or comment or... Not so much comment, but more like a question anybody has on this subject of trials. Yeah, Pastor Ralph. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, Pastor Ralph is saying that when we have relationships with people that are causing trouble, and and we may not realize that it's not so much personality or the circumstances, but it may be it may be demonic. So here I am as a Christian. I have my new heart. I'm wise, discerning. There's somebody here 
and they are uh, they can be evilly motivated demonically under the influence of of a demonic mindset and there's something about de demonization here, let's put a couple lightning bolts here and that'd be cool lightning bolts okay ac dc Okay, so uh, Pastor Ralph is saying, you know, it might be that I should realize it is possible that the spirit, is discern the spirits, John 4, verse 1. It could be that it's really evil that is going against me. And he's saying how important is it to discern that. Um, it happened to Moses in um, the book of Numbers, is it chapter uh, 17 in the Korah Rebellion? I mean, I really believe it was demonic. 250 men of renown, or is it 16? Either of those chapters, you can read the first 10 verses. Very demonic attack against Moses. I mean, to take him down and to have the Jews go back to Egypt. So this was a demonic attack against the leader. Okay? Um, when Jesus had it with his own disciples when, when Peter was trying to kind of, uh, what is it, mitigate the circumstances, kind of tone down Jesus, you know. Like, no, like, don't, you know, we're, wh why, we're not going to Jerusalem. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, you know. So, so that's a very real thing. And um, maybe one of your points is in the trials of life, um, I, I think we have three things. We all often talk about it. One is our flesh. Number one is our flesh that I, I need to be aware of. Number two is the world uh, system that is filled with snares, and, and the third one is uh, demons. So um, you got those three elements, and then you have what, what we said earlier, your circumstances, and there are all kinds of circumstances. There are those internal, uh, you have also physical circumstances, and you have also uh, relationship circumstances. Um, internal means the, the problem I have in my own heart. That's Romans 7. Physical, my health. My, my health may be, I might have health problems, uh, health uh, things that are in my body, and then relationships. Uh, circumstances at work, my boss, my girlfriend, my wife, my children, and those things. So, so in these circumstances, we have these three elements that we need to recognize. Not every problem at work could be attached to demons, but there could be demons in the picture. Not everything about my physical health can be attached to demons. But sometimes physical health and the issues of it are relating to the devil. We read that in Acts 10 and verse 38, that the devil can have authority over the physical body, Luke 13. Uh, so uh, that's kind of a... What about, last, last point in this regard, maybe, is... Um, what, what Ray mentioned when Jesus said in the prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into... Okay, so ask your neighbor, what do you think that means, that sentence? Lead us not into temptation.
All right, so what did you come up with? Did you, did you say anything? Okay, what was it? Yeah. Well, it's great to be with you guys. I feel like I'm in a good place. I haven't been led into temptation. <laughs> yes, the verse says, and do not lead us into the temptation, but the rest of it says, but deliver us from the evil, evil one. It's, lo- it's, it's like kind of, like as you said, Pastor, like God not tempt us. He tests us. But Satan, he tried to destroy the believer. And the disciples, they know. They know, and they says like, protect us from the evil. Lord, we have a faith. We follow you. Do not let Satan tempt us. Because like, the Jesus also told the Peter, and the, he's, like, he's like lion. He looked around to destroy. And the Job life, he says like, I, can't, I searched all men. But the God says, no, did you see my servant? Job. It's kind of like, uh, like the Satan acts like he know everything, but God is in control. And for believers, when they have that pray, they discern the evil. Because the, uh, John, se- John 17, uh, when Lord gave the authority to them to cast out the evil and heal the people, they realized, they faced that, and that's why they pray, uh, deliver us from the evil and do not uh, lead us into the temptation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good, good. Ray, is that good? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yes, it takes, I've thought about it a lot. And I understand what, you know, what we're, we're saying. And I like what he said. I think it's good. Here's a good question. I don't have any money. I don't have, I don't have much money. But what if, you know, somehow, here I am, I don't have much money, but somehow I have a lot of money, okay? I have a lot of money. It happens to me. I end up having a lot of money. So now, now what do you think could happen? What, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think? What do you think is going to happen? What, what could happen to me? What's that? Far country. <laughs> Far country, yeah. It seems that I don't know my own heart, but if I could stay spirit-filled, I would be able to manage this in the right way. But we also know that in history, when people get money, they change. And are they led, are they, are they led into temptation? So many times I've said, thank you, Lord, that that never happened to me. And I don't have any temptation in that regard. You know, it could be that people have some disadvantage, maybe in answer to the prayer. Do not lead me into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Because somewhere in life, it might have a change. It might change your life. It might change your life. I don't know what, what other, there's money, there's relationships. How about a girlfriend? And you have a girlfriend, and we had a guy in Bible school, out of drugs, girl, no girlfriend, left the girlfriend, got clean, was in Bible college. Another girl came, he's gone, back on drugs. Lead us not into temptation. I wonder what it means. Deliver us from evil. You know, it's like a real thing, I think. What is it? Money, girls, what else? Maybe jobs, success. How about failure? When, when you go in another direction, uh, failure, how 
disappointing it can be, and what am I tempted to do? Curse God. I'm tempted to withdraw. I'm, I'm tempted to be cold-hearted and be angry and bitter. Lead me not into temptation. It's like a very good thought for us, and I think God answers that prayer. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? Okay, so I think that's any other question on the subject of trials. Yes, Jesse. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Pa Jesse's saying, uh, using these three elements, like in my life, I know they are real, um, and how important it is for me to discern what is happening in my circumstances and what is happening. And personally, I have thought about it, and to be honest, I don't think I need to analyze it. Is what's happening to me at work, is it from the devil or not? I said, I don't know. But the answer for it is the same, that I would be spirit-filled, I would be wise, I'd be loving my enemy, um, I, would, I would learn how to rejoice always, and I would just share the goodness. You know, that's Romans 12 when it talks about doing good to those that hate you, returning, you know, mercy, um, you know, that, uh, that text there. I don't, have my, I don't have it in front of me, but Romans 12 is a good text for that. So let me summarize it and repeat it. Jesse said, how much do I need to analyze what is happening to me? I kind of feel that when I turn inside and anal try to analyze, I believe God gives a discernment, uh, analyze, forget how you spell that. I don't know, is it that one? You know the, what I'm trying to say, I can't spell it. I, I lost my orientation. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know, is it the devil? What if it is a devil? Like, it's like Judas is on the team. Judas Iscariot is on the team, and he's a devil. What, what difference does it make? Maybe I'm just going to love him anyway, pray for him anyway, and wash his feet if I need to. Actually, he left before the feet washing. But I'm trying to say my boss is demonized. Maybe he is, and he hates me. But I, in, in Psalm 23, I'm just saying one comment on that is be careful of, of like trying to analyze your environment and your world to that degree where Jesus say, let the blind lead the blind. They both will fall in a ditch. And Psalm 23 is also uh, um, my cup runs over. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. And goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And who knows, the man or the person that might be really having a very bad day or doesn't like me, I might be able to win them. And God may answer my prayer and help me understand them better. It's just a, you know. Um, and the other answer to it is uh, understanding, understanding life is Second Timothy two seven. Um, consider what I say. Consider what I say, and the Lord will give you understanding will give you understanding. So if you're in, you know, you're in Bible school and in the church and you're always learning, 
you can consider what is said and the Lord will give you discernment, give you understanding about things. Okay, anything else? Trials. So uh, another point Pastor made was the trials are going to happen in the next six years. So that was 1995, 2001, so it's over. <laughs> We're all in good place. <laughs> but uh, actually, I have seen it happen for people when they're in their 20s, like some of you are in your 20s, and you do real well. And then later, when you're 30, late 30s, early 40s, is where I see uh, people leave the church, drop off, they have family, they get, they're familiar, they lose their motivation, they, uh, they, um, they get very relaxed and they get very, you know, casual and indifferent towards things. But um, I think that um, when, the, when you are in your trial of your faith, and you just decide, and this has another, there's another side to this, this is courage, this is wisdom, this is decision making, and as you keep on making good decisions, it, it feeds back to you. You find yourself edified, you find yourself motivated, you find yourself encouraged. So there are, there is a falling away that happens uh, but um, uh, the trial of your faith is very precious. It has a big effect on your life. You may not see it immediately, but eventually you might say uh, it is an awesome thing to continue on and be faithful like through your life. Yeah, that's a very cool thing. Yeah, then you can do it. It's not difficult, actually just kind of abiding in his grace and walking in faith. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, how many minutes is the next one? Is it too, too long? Okay. All right. So we have a few minutes. Uh, why don't you... Come up with another question, one more or two more. Talk to your neighbor. Come up and just say to your neighbor, what else could we ask?
Okay. Uh, any question? Yes, Nick. Oh, wow, good. The glory or the rewards in heaven, yeah. Okay. Uh, this was like Pastor brought out the soul body. Remember that part? The soul body. Let's talk about it from a biblical, you know, what do the verses say about it, about our, our glory, you know, when we go through it. Actually, when we go through life, are we putting treasure in heaven? Right? This is a good question, right? So here, here I am. I have my new heart. I'm making good decisions. And um, there's something happening to me, like to me. Like there's some, there's relationship with God and truth. And there's actually an increase in my life. There's an invisible increase in my life. And we call that in, in the message and in our ministry, we've talked about it as a soul body. Now, we have a physical body that some one day will be resurrected and glorified. So we have a glory that is of the body, okay, that's a physical body glorified, but then you have who you are. You know, this is a, this is degrees of glory. Degrees of glory. This is 1 Corinthians 15, when it speaks about terrestrial and celestial um, material um, uh, creation, uh, the star, the moon, the stars, the moon, the, the sun, uh, the terrestrial, the trees, the plants, the grass. There are different degrees of glory. So is the resurrection. So is the resurrection. So we are not all the same when we are resurrected. Just like when we are made, we all have our own DNA. So this person here, there's he, the DNA that makes him unique. So the, eye, the uh, retina of his eye, his fingerprint, who his face, he's unique. So in the resurrection, there will be a uniqueness about every single saint because every saint's life is different. We don't have the same history. We don't have the same trials. We don't make the same decisions. But somebody that is making good decisions with God, God is increasing their their, what, what they're going to become, what they're going to be. So Paul wrote in Philippians 3 about get, having a good resurrection. Uh, we, somebody could read it. I don't know that I might have a good out resurrection. Is it verse 11? Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, when I came in, the door to my office was locked and I, I came in here, so I don't have my Bible. I'm teaching a Bible class without my Bible. That's why I'm struggling with these. First, I'm asking you, but none of you are doing anything about it. <laughs> You're not looking up in. So, yeah, it's that we would have a good resurrection, an out resurrection. It's a key, it's key, uh, Anastasius. Where, where, who has it? Is it verse 11, verse 12? Could somebody read it? Go ahead, Josh. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death, that by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Okay, but if by any means I may attain, this is. I may attain to the key. What is that, verse 12? Okay, 10 and 11, yeah, okay. So it's, 
isn't it key, Anastasia, it's out resurrection. It means have a, he knows he's going to be resurrected. It's just a matter of to what degree he's going to have glory in his resurrection. Yeah, that's what he's looking forward to. Now, a uh, pastor said that we will have our glorified body and then we will have our soul body with, that, with a degree of glory. Remember that? Degrees of glory. And maybe even you can sense it in this life that, that, that the Spirit bears witness to you that you are living to the glory of God, that your life has this value to it. You know, you will, you will sense that in your life, you know. The Holy Spirit will bear witness to you. So when we die and we are, uh, you know, we go, we fly away, Psalm 90, verse 10, um, then... Um, Let's see, we die, we fly away, our soul body has this glory. And that's because of the trials of our faith. We were, where it says in um, 2 Timothy, we are, Paul said, help me. He said, um, chapter 4, he said, I finished my course, I ran the race. And there is laid up for me, what? A crown of, what? Righteousness. Righteousness is laid up for me. That means there's a reward for me because I have kept the faith, I ran my race, I finished it, and there is laid up for me this reward. So this is actually about rewards. The degrees of glory has to do with rewards, and uh, Christians will be different in heaven in different degrees. Remember that Revelation 19, verse 10, where John was in heaven and he saw, he saw a creature and he thought it was God, and he bowed down to worship, and the creature said what? Don't worship me because I am a brother. Like, I am one of your brethren. So that means that, that that brother was so glorified that he was mistaken to be God, right? By John. So that's amazing. And what would he, be, what would he have done if he saw you up there? <laughs> okay, so, yeah, any other question, comment? Yes, Pastor Al? Okay, uh, Pastor Elva is saying to comment on the Holy Spirit in regards to this. And we could say he's doing everything. If there's any value that we have, it's a result of him being faithful and producing Christ in us. Um, he wants, God wants to conform us to the image of his son. It's promised and it's happening. Romans 8, 29, it's the end game that we would be like Christ and married to him. So how could we be married to Christ if we weren't like him? We're going to be like him, but different from him. We will not be him, but we will be his bride. Just like Adam and Eve, Eve was not him, but then she was joined to him and they were together, but she was made after Adam. And the church is made Christ was never made. He always has been and is God. 
But to be joined to God like this is such an honor. And then to walk in this life by faith is also a great honor. And it's the spirit that does it. Um, last comment on that, I think, is that the Galatians chapter 5 says um, the spirit, uh, the flesh, I'll put right this first, flesh lusteth against the spirit. But it also says the spirit lusteth against the flesh. Against the flesh. And I, I just want to, I want to enjoy this part of the sentence, this one. I'm so happy that the spirit is really against our flesh. You know, I love that. He wants to produce in us reward, benefit. He wants to produce Christ in us. He wants us to be blessed. The Spirit is in us to do that. He is for us to have victory in our lives and enjoy our life. He wants us to be thankful as simple, humble, believing. He desires our blessing because he wants God to be glorified. And the Spirit has been sent into the world so that in us we would be glorifying the Son of God. Okay? Amen. Is that good? Okay. Is it Pastor Steve? We're good? Okay. Okay, go. No, Garrett? What's that? Earlier you were like, that good, Ray? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Ray, is that okay? Can we go now, Ray? Okay, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this class tonight. In Christ's name, amen.